welcome to Eggshell Transformations, a podcast for intense people. My name is Imi, and I'm here with you on a journey. Hi everyone! Today we have Jessica Baum. She is the author of a book called Anxiously Attached. Today we will talk about what anxious attachment is, why people with an anxious attachment pattern are drawn to people with an avoidant attachment style, are there cultures that are more anxious or more avoidant, and what relational correlation is and how it can help. Now to Jessica. Hi Jessica, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So why don't we start by you telling us a bit more about yourself? Sure. I am a psychotherapist uh, with a private practice in Palm Beach. Mm. And I have about five psychotherapists that work with me. And we specialize in trauma, addiction, attachment, um, anxiety, kind of a, a whole range of different system issues. And I have a coaching business as well. So we can help people internationally and in different states with different relationship type issues. We really specialize in in relationships, not just romantic relationships, but a lot of couple issues or Mm. issues with people who are struggling with um, sustaining relationships and Mm. attachments type, type of issues. I know that you've written a book called Anxiously Attached. And as you and I both know, there are actually a lot of books out there, both academic and um, more pop psychology books on attachment theories. What do you think makes your book different? What makes you write it? I mean, my book is really different. I I share um, about my personal journey a little bit. So as a psychotherapist, mm-hmm. I do get a little bit vulnerable, but I also write the book um, as we are doing it together. So it has a feeling of co-regulation and a feeling like you're not alone as you work through the book. So it has a very compassionate, nurturing lens. And I would say that my book is different because I approach attachment from the lens of interpersonal neurobiology. So there's a lot of science there that's easy to digest. And I really um, talk about the somatics. So I talk about the body and how attachment impacts the body and where that's stored and how the sensations that we go through when we're dealing with attachment issues live in the body and what that feels like. So the reader doesn't feel crazy so that their behaviors start to make sense and they start to understand the root of why their stomach feels this way or their heart feels this way or their you know, texting a million times, or they slip into rage, I really help the reader understand this from an interpersonal neurobiology lens. And I think it sheds light in a compassionate way. So you really you get the tools for healing, you get to feel supported as you move through the book. Mm -hmm. And it just it has a very different feel. It's not like I'm a therapist telling you what to do. It's like I'm a human who has this experience and knowledge. And I'm doing it with you. The co-regulation piece is really interesting because I think there are lots of research coming out in the last decade about the power of having someone regulate with you. I mean, can you explain more to our audience what that means and how you do it through a book? Yeah, sure. I think when it comes to anxious attachment specifically, the missing developmental link, one of the missing, but the major missing developmental link is self-regulation, is learning to self-regulate. And that's because early on when we're babies, um, we're not born with a parasympathetic nervous system. So that's the part of us that rests and digests. Our mother or primary caregiver is really a stand-in for our self-soothing. And if she was struggling at all with stress or different um, nervous system responses inside her system, we didn't possibly get enough of that. And Mm -hmm. so you hear later on, like, you know, anxious people have a hard time. They need a lot of reassurance and they have a hard time settling down. And it's literally the missing wiring in their brain and in their system So there's a lot of compassion around the behaviors when their system is in sympathetic. And so the co-regulating piece is we are doing this together. And the language in which I use it is I'm I'm your friend. I'm part of your inner community, uh, your inner nurturer. Um, I've had readers reach out to me and ask, tell me that they've accessed me through the book and that the book is like this companion for you as you do your inner work. 
And I provide even somatic meditations that you can download on my, um, on my website so that you can do the inner work with my voice and my tone. And so it's very much an accompanying with um, versus like maybe a psychology book where it just tells you, here's the label, here are the conditions. This is more of like, this is why, and we can handle Mm -hmm. this together. And by no means is my book an end all be all in healing, but it's definitely a pathway to opening up Mm -hmm. a lot of doors towards more healing for your, for the reader's personal development. So let's bring our audience up to speed with the premise of our discussion. I think a lot of them would probably know what attachment theory is, but maybe maybe give us a snapshot and tell us how it's relevant to our world today. Oh my God, yeah, for sure. I love that question. And I think it's so relevant for mm. our world today. And, yeah. you know, often... I see the labels being thrown around a lot online. I even talk about them, but really attachment is a lot about embedded patterns and what gets laid down really, really early on in our developmental process in terms of our nervous system and the lens in which we see the world and how we experience the felt sense of relationships, whether they're safe or not. So early on with our primary caregivers, there's something called co-regulation and we're really one energetic unit with our primary caregivers and the way they attend to our needs and see us as separate beings, but also are curious with us and are in attunement with us lays down like the foundation of our inherent trust of how our needs are going to get met and rupture and repair, which we can talk about, but that All those things lay down our nervous system, our nervous system's responses, our felt sense, our relationship safe, is the ball going to drop, our experiences with internal and external boundaries. And so we can develop something called a secure base, which is, you know, someone who has an inherent trust in relationships, or we can um, develop insecure attachment styles or embedded patterns. And there, you know, or there are three different kinds of, of different ways of relating in terms of how we adapted with our primary caregivers. And so mm-hmm. one of the ways is, is with anxious attachment. There's also avoidant attachment, which I talk a lot about anxious and avoidant because they tend to attract each other. And oh, then I'd there's love to hear more about that. We'll come back to <laughs> and that. And then there's yeah, and I talk a lot about that in my book. It's funny because I have avoidant people buying my book as well. I think anxious people are fascinated with avoidant people and because the attraction's so big, I think it's important to understand the the nervous system and, and have compassion for how different attachment patterns um, adapted to survive. And then there's fearful avoidant, which is sometimes like it can be seen as a combination of both. But you don't so we have to... anxious, avoidant, fearful, avoidant. And secure. And secure. And yeah. is there a disorganized or is that fearful avoidant? That would be disorganized. And ambivalent would be anxious. There's different mm-hmm. scientific names for them, depending mm-hmm. on what literature you're being. But for the for the layman, it's it's fearful avoidant usually, but sometimes they refer to that as disorganized. So how would you define in a few sentences anxious attachment? So yeah, so anxious attachment, which I heavily define myself as, is someone who is hyper vigilant of the external world, like I just was. Um, and in order to adapt as a, a baby, they actually became very attuned to their primary caregivers. So they knew their moods, their feelings, they sometimes adjusted for that. So sometimes they uh, self abandon. So they self-sacrifice, they can self-abandon. They're often seen as um, more codependent traits in a relationship in terms of self-sacrificing. I call it self-bliss because in order to survive, they had to kind of stop listening to what was going on inside and they start to become hyper-focused to what's going on outside. Ah, Yeah. That's beautifully said. Yeah. They can be very zeroed in on their love interests um, the mood of their love interest, how close their love interest is to them. They usually have an underlying fear of abandonment. So they want to people please or keep their love interest very close. So they don't have to feel the abandonment that might be underneath, un- underneath it. That's always kind of lurking there. Mm-hmm. So I would say, you know, anxious people tend to expand their energy 
when they're upset. So they, I refer to this as the octopus in my book, cause they, they go to sympathetic arousal and they expand. So whether that's running towards their partner or people pleasing, sometimes they get angry if their needs aren't met, but they, they have an expansion typically to get back into connection because that's our, um, every, every type's biological imperative is always to stay in connection. And a lot of these adaptations are, how can I stay in connection? How did my system, my nervous system learn to stay in connection when I was small? So this would be a baby that, um, that gets louder and screams more, um, to get their parents' attention and expands their energy. A, a true avoidant, and I think a lot of people might have avoidant protectors, um, which look very different. That could be someone who is anxious, who's smothered by their parent, but a true avoidant had parents who were more left hemisphere based. And what I mean by that is that they relate to the baby um, less from an emotional place and more from like a to-do place, a mm. transactional place. Like they can tell their baby has needs, but their emotional IQ isn't as high. So those parents tend to focus a little more on um, success and achievement, which we get a lot in our culture. But the av avoidant child inherently learns, I'm not going to get my needs met, or I'm not seeing, see, being seen in, uh, in the, through this emotional lens. So they have an inherent distrust in relationships, which usually looks like when they're adults, very independent, almost like they're self-sufficient. They're like counter-dependence is what I call it. Like Count the opposite of dependence. Yeah. 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 Counter-dependence. Mm -hmm. and, and they can look selfish but it's really a state of survival. It's also a sympathetic state of activation because they don't trust that their needs are going to get met. So they have a really hard time being vulnerable and asking for their needs to be met. And they usually shut down their energy, mm -hmm. um, which is often still a sympathetic state, but they'll move away. They'll distance themselves um, with different distancing strategies because it's too scary to get close and that intimacy feels a little too uh, vulnerable for them. Mm -hmm. So they tend to, when you get close to them in a relationship, they can back up and create mm -hmm. space because unconsciously they're very scared of getting close and underneath that they're very scared of getting hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, that in itself deserves another whole episode but I've heard of something the distinction you said earlier about protector versus true avoidance is interesting because one theory I have heard and I'm ambivalent about is that everyone is anxious <laughs> underlying everyone is anxious avoidant is just a different way of coping with the underlying anxious attachment have you heard of that and what are your thoughts on that um, yeah, well, here's that's I mean, so that's I think it's all layered, and I think that might be the difference between a true avoidant and an avoidant protector, but absolutely. So anxiety around connection mm. is true on both insecure mm. types of of relating. Um, the avoidant person has anxiety, but the way in which they deal with their anxiety is to retrieve. The anxious person have it, has anxiety. They're, they're more likely to externalize their anxiety and you're more likely to see it. An avoidant person can feel very stoic on the outside, yes. but inside there's a lot of anxiety. That's and right. so you don't see it. And an anxious person might feel like, oh, this person's really independent and they're really successful and they have this figured out, but really inside there's a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say that anxiety conscious or not conscious is on both sides, but the anxious person usually gets pegged for the anxiety the most because of the way the anxiety is so externalized and mm -hmm. expressed. Yeah, well said. That explains it really, really well. The way I understand this is under anxiety underlies both, but they have a completely different ways, a different scheme to deal with it. One is to avoid and one is to const constantly seek attachment to the point where it's chaotic. And mm -hmm. I think the description that you gave certainly overlaps with that. You know, it certainly sounds like a laser ground for codependency. And so let's mm -hmm. talk a bit about that because in your book, you talk about people losing themselves. So, yeah. I mean, I'd like really struggle with the word codependency because mm. I think in our culture, 
you know, it's pushed to become independent and it's really interdependency that we, we all want. So for someone like myself who's struggled with quote unquote codependency, I swung the pendulum and I was fed these messages that you have to be super independent and self-reliant, which is actually not how we're biologically wired. And there's a lot of shame attached to codependency. Mm -hmm. And the truth is we need to depend on people. And it's actually depending when we're babies, it's the sense that we can depend Mm -hmm. that builds self-regulation and interdependency as adults when we can't depend as babies, we either become scared that we won't be able to depend as adults and become more anxious, or we become hyper independent and more avoidant. Both both of those are adaptations of not learning healthy inter- interdependency, which mm-hmm. is I can rely on reliable people. And the more that I rely on reliable people, the more myself I feel. Mm-hmm. And so I can have, I can have autonomy and I can have connection and that, you know, being really close doesn't feel threatened and having space doesn't feel threatened. And all of that foundational felt sense of being okay with those different, you know, kind of ways of being in relationship with another is laid down with our earliest experiences mm-hmm. and, and what felt scary or what was confirmed for us early on. Absolutely. And what I love the most about the re- you know, object relations and relational way of working is that it talks about healthy dependency, which almost feels like a no-no. You know, a lot of clients would come to therapy and say, I'm afraid of becoming dependent on you. And I might say to them, actually, there is such a thing as healthy dependency. Would you Mm -hmm. agree with that? Yeah, I mean, it's called interdependency. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you get to be all of you and I get to be all of me, but I know that you care enough about me that I could call you. And if you weren't even available, I have an inherent trust Mm. that when you were available, because I'm important to you, Mm. that you would get to me and vice versa. And I also can allow you to be uniquely yourself. That doesn't Mm. threaten me Mm. and I can be uniquely myself and that doesn't threaten you. And once we start to depend on people that are dependable, we actually become less dependent and more ourselves. So it's a beautiful paradox But I think a lot of people maybe didn't experience that or don't have a frame of reference around that. And I think therapists and coaches that really know what they're doing really start to understand, no, this is the space I'm supposed to hold. You're supposed to depend on me like you would a parent to some degree, um, but with, you know, with boundaries that even if I'm not available in between sessions or whatever, that you inherently trust that I have your best interest at heart. And then I'm going to be there for you to kind of reparent and learn how to retrust in relationships. And then you take that experience and you try to find dependable friendships and dependable relationships that are not codependent, but also, you know, healthy, you know, and what a new healthy relationship is, is, is what you want to start to model for your clients. And then they can start to take that out into the world. It really is much easier said than done, though, because we both know when human relates, no matter what attachment we have, there are things that trigger each other. It's hard to be fully yourself. I think a lot of people have a lot of bad experience of their true self being rejected, being boycotted, being criticized. Yeah, I mean, I think that I actually think being, I call it activated or awakened with your therapist or with your friends is, is a flashlight in and that rupture or conflict is healthy it the problem is is that repair if the repair is there and the repair requires empathy and understanding and seeing what got touched inside of you and being able to kind of see it in the context of wow that makes sense and you can actually grow closer in your romantic relationships or in any relationships when you have healthy repair and that goes back to infancy because rupture and repair is something that happens with your primary caregiver So if you didn't have great rupture and repair experiences, and again, it only needs to be in alignment 33% of the time. Yes, yes. I talked about this in the last episode about the good enough mother. And it's such a relief to know that you only need to be there 30% of the time, not 100. And it's actually would be bad if you're there 100% of the time. And what was I going to say? Do you have a story, a case or something you can share with us about 
someone bringing their attachments push pull into the relationship and you repairing the rupture? Sure. I have one client. I love her. And she would just push my buttons. Yep. And at, <laughs> at some point, you know, I, I remember having like one or two ruptures with her mm. around trust and things like that. And I had to own my pieces too. And we would come back and we would deeply talk about it. And it would just bring us closer. And she would start to see me not only as a therapist, but as a human who's doing the best that I could, you know? And I think it started to help her see that when she ruptures with anyone, that there's a lot more to the story. One, her rupture makes sense. And two, when you come back and you talk about it honestly and openly with someone who's capable of humility and saying, yeah, well, that makes sense. And this is what was going on for me. And let's talk about it. You actually build so much more trust because again, it's not about the perfect therapist. It's not about the perfect person. It's about inherently trusting that therapist, even when they miss a beat, even when they're not completely in, you know, in attunement with you, that they're human and they're inherently just trying their best. And so that all comes down to trust. Mm -hmm. And I even tell, you know, I, I have a team of five therapists. I even tell them it's okay to rupture with your clients. It's okay. When conflict comes up, let's use it therapeutically because this is the groundwork where they can start to learn other light bulb moments around, Oh, okay. This is what came up. This is how I reacted. And now we can start to look at it through a new If you line. don't mind me asking, what buttons did she or they pushed in you? Um, well, I one client, this is a different client, started to question my trust, oh. um, that she didn't trust me. Um, she had a little bit of trust issues with every single person in her world. So it would make sense that at some point she would have trust issues with me. But I yeah, felt like I gave a thousand percent and more. So my ego kind of felt like, oh my God, like, I can't believe she doesn't trust me after everything that we've been through. So I was hurt by that. And then I had to realize, no, this is her original wound yeah. just being kind of projected onto me, which it yeah. should be. Yeah. And I was able to work through that with her. And it was a beautiful way for her to realize not in a romantic relationship, but in a, a close relationship, rupture and repair. Yeah. And then the other client who was in addiction, she seemed to have crises every time I would take a break. So I would take like a vacation or a honeymoon and, and she seemed to have crises that I couldn't manage at the time. And then she would get upset with me That's quite when I wasn't available. Yeah. And so while it makes sense that she was in her crisis and I was also like, just not available, it like brought up a lot in me in terms of how am I going to share that I'm not always available or I can't always meet your needs. And it was a little overwhelming for me, but actually sh she and I have a beautiful relationship now. And I think she understands that like, I'm a human being that gets overwhelmed when I'm in the middle of a foreign country and I can't handle a crisis and, you know, and maybe my response wasn't perfect at the time. So all those things come up when you're, when you are that stable person for someone mm -hmm. who's just learning how to trust and that you don't answer perfectly. Really mm. Yeah. I think, thank you for sharing that. It's beautiful. And it's such a beautiful gift that you were able to stay because I do think a lot of people would have just said it's too much and then they leave their romantic partners probably have done that and a lot of times therapists would do that too where ethical or not you know they feel that they can't handle it and they become afraid um and I think I guess we all have our kryptonites we all have our buttons that can easily get pushed and it's so important that we are aware of them and no I mean from your lips to every therapist listening, I think therapists need to be constantly looking at what gets touched inside of them because we take our clients in and, and they become part of us and they impact us too. And it's really important to keep looking at that. In my staff meetings, I talk about, okay, let's talk about cases. And now let's talk about what's being touched inside of you when you're working with that client, because right. both sides need a lot of awareness. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that's really sad and very powerful is when people are really anxious, I, I, maybe they're anxious avoidant, they would almost 
intuit what can push your button and push it to test you. Uh-huh. And it's so sad because a lot of people in their life would have failed the test and actually leave. Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think I've even done that in my life with a therapist before, like, oh, she doesn't really care about me and I pay her. And, you know, you'll come up with all the reasons, protective things to, you know, those are actually protectors. And so when I think of an anxious person kind of pushing buttons or pushing someone away, Mm -hmm. it's really a part of them that is built in to protect them from feeling the loss they might feel or the pain they may feel around this person. So they start to test to make sure that person's really there for them, no matter what. And, you know, if a therapist can really hold the space, um, you know, usually you just keep coming back to, yeah, no, it is. I I do care. And this is what I'm willing to give. And this is where my boundaries are, but I absolutely do care. And so it's trust. It's the trust Mm -hmm. stuff that comes up even with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was a rich exploration. Can people fluctuate between anxious and avoidant? Can they change? Yeah. So, I mean, this is like a big misconception out there that I'm trying to help everyone see is that attachment styles are embedded patterns that show up in relationship to the other person's embedded patterns as well. So it's a two-way street. Attachment is a two-way street. So I might become more anxious with someone who's more avoidant Mm -hmm. and I might become more avoidant with someone who's more anxious. Usually we have a default around our nervous system and how our response to pain and where our lens is. And usually that default can show up, but I talk a lot about the wheel of attachment and not seeing the labels as static, but it's more of a spectrum and it's more of a combination of two people's embedded patterns, the relational energy and the dance that those patterns take up in that, in that, in that relationship. And you can be inherently anxious and still show up avoidant depending on who you attach to. Sometimes those are avoidant protectors. And so it's layered, it's complicated. You can even have pockets of disorganized or fearful avoidance show up. If you had experiences early on of disorganization and you're with someone, let's say an anxious person is with someone who's really avoidant Mm -hmm. and it's a really turbulent relationship, pockets of disorganization can show up as well. Um, And if you're someone who's anxious and you're with someone secure, you could move towards security as well. So it's not static. It's not category, even though we like our left brain wants to make everything fit into a category. It they're really embedded patterns. They really move in, in a circle and um, forming more secure relationships, whether it's therapist, coaches, friendships, knowing what secure relationships are, which I can go over will help you move towards security over time through neuroplasticity, but it's always changing. And if you have pockets of even a brief period of disorganization, let's say one of your parents went through a divorce or there was a period of time in your home when there was a lot of confusion and your attachment system got really confused, that could show up in the here and now. And so people can be really confused and say, well, I'm avoiding or I'm anxious or, and, and you can have pockets of a lot of things. What I say in my book is you usually have a default in terms of how you, um, how your nervous system responds in pain around disconnection. You either run towards or you can run away, but that can vary um, in a lot of different situations. And it's just not that black and white. Yes, clearly explained. Thank you. Mm, so basically it, it ties back into their interdependence you were saying earlier is everything is relative you change dependence on where you are and who you're with it's very interesting mm-hmm. i have a very strange but intriguing question do you think there are cultures that tend to be more anxiously or avoidantly attached yes absolutely i mean i think the american culture is moving more towards those two insecure types just oh, this is intergenerational and this is pretty deep um but due to our brain development and how we're shifted a little bit more left in this culture so the left side would be a little bit more of uh, 
separate me versus you, transactional, achievement-based, success-based, productivity-based. The right side is more in touch with emotional intelligence and, and, and a lot of things. But when you're a baby, you're mirroring your mother's brain. And, you know, your wiring is really a product of her wiring. So there's an intergenerational thing that's been passed down through the like the industrial well through farming in Europe and and the way we're evolving. But I would say cultures that are, you know, more in touch with the land and more um, community based and relating to each other in more of a collective way would yeah. be more secure would yeah. form more security, um, you know, communities that our ancestors had where you were allowed to be uniquely yourself, but um, part of the community and that we lived in more community with more security around us, with more family around us. Um, we had more relationships that mattered. We didn't like get married and move into a house and kind of mm -hmm. live more of an isolated existence. So yeah, I think our even internet, like our a culture is mo moving sadly towards more insecure uh, styles, and we have a very transactional way of dating in our in our world, and a very unrealistic way of what relationships mean, and the evolution of relationships. And when things get hard and wounds starts to show up, our culture tends to say, "Well, get a divorce. You know, this is the wrong person." go back out there and there's a million different options out there and the problem exists outside of you. And so that's hurting what marriages really are about, which is to work through our core wounds and they're not portals of bliss. Sometimes they're really, really hard work. And a lot of people don't have the resources or the knowledge that you're supposed to face parts of yourself in your marriage. And just because it's hard doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. And by no means am I saying abuse is okay, but I'm saying sometimes when it gets hard, it's it's a flashlight in. It's not necessarily the time to jump ship. Interesting. And I think when people migrate from one, from one country to the other, that becomes even more interesting. The cultural shock and the attachment pattern which again is another whole episode. There is one thing that I think we absolutely need to address, which is the anxious avoidant couple dance. So you said that they commonly attract each other. I see, I see that too, especially people who come to us. Have you ever seen avoidant avoidant pair? Yeah, of course. That's yeah, the course. couple that lives together and they are really comfortable with parallel living. Um, but I would say there's sometimes they don't tend to attract each other. There's not a lot of chemistry or connection in those relationships. Um, I've seen them work though. I mean, into each its own, it's, it's almost like a couple that maybe lives completely separate lives. Maybe they live in different States and they see each other a couple of times a year. I actually heard about that from someone recently where the, the relationship works for this couple because they see each other a couple times a year and they're very, very separate in their lives. And, you know, sometimes that works. It just, you know, it's, it lacks um, a joining, a real joining and, and, yeah. and maybe, you know, who are we to say that, that, that relationship doesn't work maybe exactly. for that, you know, that couple, it does work, you know, and that's where everybody's different in terms of their relational needs. And so exactly. if you are, yeah, if you're someone who doesn't need a lot of connection and wants a lot of independence, then you should look for someone who's also very independent and wants the same thing because you're likely to match in relationship needs. You might not match in chemistry. And so that's where it gets a little tricky. I really agree with that. And I think we doing this line of work has to be careful about these golden standards of how things should be. And I think when you are out there dating, you want to be really honest about what your needs are. And yeah. someone who's really anxious wants a lot of time together, exactly. a lot of reassurance. And if you're dating someone who's really independent, then you're probably attracted to the lost parts of yourself. And the uh, relational needs will always be in competition. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And so one person will always want space and freedom and independence. And the other person will always seek closeness and more time together. So those very needs will be a mismatch it's from so the beginning. Common, though. So common. I believe that every relationship has a dance around intimacy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the anxious avoidant dance is actually pretty common in most relationships because our patterns show up and one person's needs are going to be a little bit different than yours. I think if the wounding isn't too deep and there's an ability to compromise, you can work through those different relational needs. But if you're really wanting a lot of time together, one-on-one connection and your love language is time together and your partner loves their independence and really doesn't want to give their time or really focuses on their career, you're going to set yourself up for a lot of disappointment just inherently on how different the relational needs are, or what your needs are. So I think knowing that on the front end is important. I also think that anxious people and avoidant people are attracted to each other for a reason. And, you know, when it gets hard and I can, you want me to share about why I think they're attracted to each other? <laughs> of course, <laughs> go ahead. Um, yeah, there's a multitude of reasons and we have an energetic imprint or signature that goes out there. But Oh, wow. Yes, um, and people would say, I didn't know that. They didn't say anything. I said, well, there's an unconscious pattern. And they yes. would say, no, there's no information on the dating profile. They didn't say anything in writing. And I say, mm-hmm. I don't know what it is, but there's something, something in the vibe, in the picture. It's unconscious. Yes, it, mm-hmm. it is. There's an unconscious, unconscious pack, which I talk about in chapter mm-hmm. two, around how we replay our core wounds and our subconscious beliefs in our relationship. And usually there's a theme that shows up, you know, that's a lot deeper than the relationship. And I often say you can put you know, you can put a a quote unquote anxious codependent person in a room with a hundred people and they'll find the alcoholic or the addict or the one person that will abandon them because of their own wounding and they will be fiercely attracted to that person. And so there's a lot going on underneath the surface when you meet someone. And we often try to meet people who will fulfill our needs, but that, that, is kind of an illusion in the beginning. They usually end up hurting the very thing that we think that they'll fulfill because it's not a, it's not an adult um, wound. It's, it's that needs to be healed with another adult per se. And even that is complicated, but um, anxious people tend to be attracted to stoic alpha um, people who don't appear anxious on the outside. So they feel very put together And uh, avoiding people tend to be attracted to like the liveliness and the vulnerability, the quote unquote vulnerability of an anxious person. And so often they're attracted to the lost parts of themselves and they're not even aware of it. And there's so many more factors than just that. So if you're listening and that doesn't resonate with you, there's a lot of reasons why we pick the people we do. And I think if you're in a hard relationship that is awakening a lot of pain in you, it's usually implicit memory that's being awakened. So if you can bring those painful sensations to a therapist Mm. to hold them, you'll often connect to much deeper parts of yourself that the relationship is stirring up. So whether the relationship works out or not, I don't know because every relationship Mm. is different, but if a lot is getting touched inside of you and a lot of pain is coming up to the surface, it's definitely an invitation to do more of your own healing. And if you can look at it just like that, it becomes a very empowering way to look at what's surfacing in your relationship. And if you're lucky enough to have a partner to want to do the work with you, then you can do what we do in Imago and you can get conscious together. But Mm -hmm. either way, if the pain is surfacing inside of you, it's definitely empowering to know that's an invitation for you to do your own healing work with or without your partner. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's say something about healing then. How do people f- go from being mm, other focused to being self-full? Because I think a lot of people they focus on themselves. Either they find nothing and feel an emptiness or they feel very selfish. Yeah. Well, I mean, I might go into this in depth, but selfish and selfless are born of sympathetic, mostly sympathetic, sometimes shut down states. So dorsal for those who want the science and 
those are survival states and self full state, which is something we vacillate in and out. It's not like we stay in these states all the time, but it's a ventral state of learning that I can meet my needs in the relationship and I can meet my needs, my, my own needs. And I understand my internal boundaries and my external boundaries and that it's okay to take care of myself. And that requires, well, you said emptiness, but it requires a relationship to our deeper self, our inner child, what I refer to as inner me, a little me, but also our hearts, our guts, our fascia, our bodies to become more embodied. And if there's a sense of emptiness in there, that's just more information around being with that emptiness and starting to understand that that's probably something that was felt early on. And as a way to avoid that, we became other focused. Um, Sometimes with anxious people, it's not emptiness, but it's like a lot of sensations inside. And so a lot of the meditations I give are about meeting what's inside, not fixing it, not controlling it, not trying to do anything with it, but meeting the sensational experience that lives in our body, because that's where the embedded um, trauma is. So it's about becoming more embodied and being more and more with what, what you might be think you're avoiding essentially. So learning to be with your heart center and your gut and your body and your experiences and having a new relationship to them and starting to see them as older embedded parts or stored memory. And if you can't do it, sometimes you can do it in the presence of another, because sometimes that needs to be experienced with another. So I think, you know, healing, anxious attachment or avoidant, any insecure attachment is an ability to be more and more with yourself and the parts of yourself that you might be avoiding. Even anxious people are avoiding these parts and being with these parts in the supportive, nurturing presence of others so you can integrate them and start to connect back to where the, the origin of those wounds are. Beautifully said. Thank you. <sighs> Final few questions. Okay. If we never had it, you mentioned a good inner nurturer. I think we intuitively understand what that means. If we never yeah. had... Actually, I think I have an answer to that question. I'll ask it anyway. If we never had a good nurturer, how are, how are we going to build an inner nurturer we, if we had no role models? Yeah, and it, you know, it's a deep question. It's probably, it's a felt experience, so it's hard to explain, but we take in the essence of our primary caregivers and they mm-hmm. become part of our psyche and you know, often when working with clients, whether it was a dog, an aunt, a teacher, me, and it does not have to be your mother or your father, but there usually is someone or something in your past that gave you a sense of unconditional love, calmness, security. And if, if there's not, we have to start to imagine that and not only imagine that we have to imagine what it feels like in our body to be in the presence of that. I've had a client tell me that their sixth grade teacher was the most nurturing person. And so we honed in on that feeling and the felt sense of being around that teacher. And so there's usually something in your past that was loving enough for you to grab onto and resource. And if not, then we have to create that and imagine the felt sense of that. Um, And that's a little bit more work. I kind of hate it when people are like, go love yourself. It's like, if you haven't had an experience of unconditional love, it's really hard to cultivate self-love from within because self-love comes from the the external experience of love being internalized from Mm -hmm. within. But I think a lot of people might have moments, if not a relationship out there that they can identify as this was kind, this was nurturing. And that's usually where you start and you start to build on. And if not, then we have to create that, which is a little bit harder, but very doable. And that was a really good answer way beyond. I thought you were just going to say something like co-regulation, but no, you gave me above and beyond. I really see your deep care for your clients and this work and your, your passion to go above and beyond and really create a healing space for them. Thank you for doing what you do. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And I could tell just by your questions, even from your email, I was like, 
this girl knows what she's talking about. She's going <laughs> to ask me a lot of questions. And yeah, I'm glad that you did because a lot of them are around science and we're trying to get this information out there to the general public so that they can start healing. Cause that's, you know, that's what we all want is a pathway an understanding. And it's really important to spread the message. So thank you for having me on your podcast. Thank you. And yeah, I think it's important work. Anybody who's listening, I think we all have attachment patterns we're continuously working with. And I think if anything, just raising awareness that A, you're not alone, B, creating awareness around this stuff is the first step to healing and getting curious. So yeah, the more that we can individually take care of ourselves and bring more awareness to ourselves, the more we're healing collectively. And that hopefully is the goal. Yeah, there's so much more I can ask you, but I think I want to be respectful of your time. And I think we have enough to digest for now. So thank you so, so much for your work and for today. Let's stay connected. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. For more, please head to eggshelltherapy.com. There you will find more stories, articles, and resources for people just like me and you. Bye now. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Moving forwards, never looking back. Just one more foot in front of all those countless others. And we're there.